We come now to Lecture 35, the 20th Century and Theological Liberalism, but please indulge me as I take a few more minutes on the previous topic that concerned the 19th century and the modern missionary movement. You remember I called your attention to the fact that though the missionary movement really began with Calvinistic uh, missionaries, a, a present-day scene, and really during the 19th century, the transition from a predominantly Reformed missionary endeavor to a predominantly Arminian one took place. Uh, we've analyzed Arminianism a little bit more at an earlier period, but now we're addressing the question with respect to evangelism and missionary work and winning people to Jesus Christ. And the question I asked was whether, indeed, an Arminian missionary can do this. My answer, I said, was yes and no. Now, the answer is yes in this sense, because evangelical Arminians profess faith in the divine Christ, his atoning blood, his inspired word, and many, many other elements of Christian truth. People hearing those essential truths, unlike people hearing the liberal denial of them, may be saved. We must never forget that point, that Arminianism is evangelical. It does proclaim the gospel. It tells of a divine Christ who died vicariously for the sins of the people. And that we must never forget, and for that we'll always be profoundly grateful. But along with it are other doctrines that we'll come to in a moment. But right now I'll say, when an Arminian speaks his version of Christianity, a person who hears him hears essential core Christianity. The gospel is there. There's no denying that. And if the people really do believe in the Jesus Christ preached by the Arminians, they'll believe in the Christ of the gospel. He's a second person of the Trinity. He is absolutely divine. He has a true and a sinless human nature. He died vicariously on the cross. He rose bodily from the grave. He's going to come again in the clouds of heaven. You know those basic verities will be carried to the ends of the earth by people who are truly Arminian and truly evangelical. In that sense, yes, the core of the gospel is there. The answer is also no. I think you'll probably anticipate what I'm saying here because I tried to spell it out with more detail than I can do now when we were looking more precisely at the development of that theology, but let me explain again. The answer is also no. Arminian evangelism rests on the profound error that fallen man is not dead spiritually, but only dying. He's therefore supposed to be able to bring about his own new birth by his self-generated faith. This can never happen. No one can ever be saved by himself, even with the help of the Holy Spirit. Usually when I point this out to Arminians, they say, don't forget, we're relying on the help of the Holy Spirit. Help even from the Holy Spirit is not going to do any good for a corpse. You need more than help. And all you're offering is help. You're admitting the person is sick and dying, but you don't admit what the Bible says, namely, he is dead. And as long as he's dying, of course you can help him. And of course the Holy Spirit can help him more but if he is dead, as the Bible says, and you in some unguarded moments do say, because the word is explicit and inevitable and so on, the Holy Spirit's help is not going to do any good for a corpse. I hope and believe that multitudes of Arminians really believe the truth they do hold in spite of the otherwise fatal errors they proclaim to the world. So in a sentence, can an Arminian be a missionary? Can persons actually be saved by persons who are propagating such errors? Yes, because they are propagating such truths, such glorious truths that cause us to embrace them as fellow Christians and ask them to accept us as the same, but at the same time as an integral part of their theology. 
is an element which, if it's taken seriously, understood and acted upon by hearers of the Arminian gospel, they will never be saved. They never can be saved, and they're worse in that case than falling afoul of liberals because liberals don't even pretend to be Orthodox Christians. And nobody who embraces a liberal version of the gospel has any, under, any delusions about it being the historic gospel of the Apostles' Creed. But these people are evangelical. They believe in the Bible. They worship Jesus Christ. You tend to trust them. If you trust their errors, it's fatal. If you rely on their way of converting, you'll never be converted. Let's try to hold both these ideas that aren't mutually exclusive, that they are manifestly inconsistent in the balance when we think about it. But we come now to the 20th century theological liberalism. One, we have but one more decade of the 20th century, completing two millennia since the Son of God became incarnate and was delivered up for our offenses. I must remind some of you how deeply significant that is for uh, certain people, people who believe that we have a young earth and that uh, the creation of man, if it was not 4004 B.C., was nevertheless in a period something like that. Well, there was a tradition, you know, when that was generally accepted, as today it is generally not accepted, we don't think the world is young, and we don't think that man was created in such a recent period as that, though it may not be nearly as remote a time as some evolutionists suppose. But uh, if actually this is the end of the 6,000th year, you see two uh, centuries after Christ, two millennia after Christ came and four before he came, then uh, if you go with the idea of a millennium coming, as many people did, this could very well be the beginning of the millennium after which Christ would come, if that is the uh, post-millennial view, or it could be the time when Christ will come and introduce his millennium according to the premillennial view. You know in the post-millennial view, the millennium comes and Christ comes after it. And in the premillennial view, Christ comes before the millennium which follows his coming. But in either case, there are great big people who are still satisfied this is a young earth and the creation was something like 4,000 years before Christ and so on. Then we're coming up to the magical period and something like the millennium will be expected. So I presume at the end of the next decade, there'll be a great deal of faith along those lines, literature, debates, and so on taking place is, of course, a whole calculation is out of record and there's no justification for believing that man was created so recently and so on. It has no particular significance in the ecclesiastical calendar, but at the same time, there's always a period of excitement around the turn of a century and people are always anticipating more and more unusual things happening that are full filling of some previously unexamined or unfulfilled prophecy. I remember a professor of mine teasing on one occasion that he, he was sure, now this was back in the 40s when the, when the um, A-bombs were just appearing, he was sure that somebody was going to find in this the abomination of desolation. I have never encountered anybody who has seen the A-bomb as the fulfillment of what Christ said and what Daniel had said about the abomination of desolation, but the liberal professor was predicting that. I'm, I'm myself, though I've never encountered anybody who's pointed to that as being fulfilled in the dropping of the A-bomb and so on and the danger of it. I'd be very much surprised if somebody hasn't. And, Maybe somebody here can tell me or write me a letter saying, oh yeah, I know that. Here's a book in which you can read about it. But at any rate, the turn of a century <coughs> has that same kind of fascination for people and it must be a period when some unique fulfillment of some hidden or esoteric prophecy comes to pass. Two, how goes the gospel in the world at the end of the 20th century? There is no way of getting full or accurate statistics, though there are many useful attempts. There are vast studies of uh, 
the growth or decline of this or that denomination, this or that religion, many maps and so on. Uh, those of you who are interested in it, uh, I assure you there's a vast bibliography indicating in great detail and with the numerical precision the expansion or retraction of religions in various countries at various epochs and so on at various times. And this is 1989 right now, and you could find the most up-to-date statistics on 19. 89 even so far, certainly on 1988, but still I'm saying there's no way of getting accurate understanding, even though you have the most meticulous and computer-produced uh, uh, statistics. Even then, you, one can only make educated guesses. Mine is this, and this is all this is, an educated guess. The vast majority, maybe 90% of professing Christendom does not profess Christianity. Or rather, it doesn't understand the Christianity it professes. I've told you that before at various times in the history of the church, but here we are, perhaps close to the return of Christ, perhaps not, but after nearly two millennia, of church history where the Christ's gospel has gone into all corners of the earth and you have disciples everywhere speaking every kind of a language, this particular historian has to say that he thinks that 90% of professing Christendom is not authentic Christianity. I think those of you who've been following these lectures to this point will realize that even though there was this magnificent 19th century of missionary evangelism, and even though you belong to churches where there have been vigorous endeavors in that direction and many people are going forth as witnesses around the earth and the exploits of missionaries are fabulous and all corners of the earth are being reached and so on, it seems strange to hear somebody say virtually, it could be put this way, 90% of the world is unevangelized. Maybe this wouldn't be quite so uh, uh, shocking, if it is shocking at all, if I remind you that we all recognize that literacy is not keeping pace with illiteracy and that more people are dying before they hear the gospel now than ever, uh, that the rate of growth is outpacing the rate of Christian missions and so on. That just reminds you in context, so there is a tremendous missionary thrust, and it's very, very admirable, deeply appreciated by all of us, and so on. It certainly doesn't touch half the population of the world. But what this is actually saying is that even the half which it did and does touch, most of them don't understand the gospel. And what they're believing wouldn't meet a satisfactory definition of it. Now, as I say, it's just an educated guess, and many of you will say you are hopelessly pessimistic, and you may be quite right. It is pessimistic. I wish I could say that 90% of the world is evangelized, and 100% of those who are professing Christ are, we have a right to believe, are Christian people, but anybody in the United States who lives in any typical mainline congregation knows full well that is not true firsthand. All I am saying is, if you consider what we've remarked before, that the missionary movement itself moved from sound Calvinistic hands very quickly to unsound Arminian evangelical hands, and that that predominates in missionary endeavor today. And if what we have say is true, the way by which they appeal for evangelism is unsound. If anybody responds to their witness, supposing that he can initiate that faith itself as a work of the flesh and not a work of God. Every time I study anything closely or looking at I remember missionaries in a certain section of India. I don't even remember what book or where or when I read this, but once a few, couple years ago, something like that, I was reading an account of a certain mission in a certain part of India. And one of the persons in that missionary establishment, which was manifestly, outwardly, very successful, growing rapidly, almost the whole area was adopting the Christian faith. One of these missionaries who impressed me considerably 
as a sound and a penetrating one was reporting to headquarters. This is utterly superficial. There is no ground for believing that these people who are joining the church understand what they're doing or are evangelical or reformed Christians in any sense of the word. Now, you don't very often get blasts like that from the mission field. And you don't get home mission boards shook up by statements as drastic as that may be for various and sundry reasons. But at any rate, the point is you can know about something. I can think of one mission in northern India and the sweeper cast, where the sweeper cast just came in en masse. This was on the island of Tahiti. Just about everybody adopted the gospel at one time when their princes did, and so on. Now, you know, if you know anything of the history of missions, that that doesn't represent individual conversions. These people are embracing it. They're giving up their heathenism and so on. They're calling themselves Christian. But if Christianity is a change of heart, a new repentance, a living relationship with Jesus Christ, you're talking about something else. So I'm just saying that uh, this somber figure of mine is not quite as unjustified as it may seem to some of you. And while I'm glad to admit that it may be extreme, and I hope to God it's wrong, nevertheless, if I had to make an estimate, it would have to be something like that. Number four, Pelagianism was the early church's form of professed Christians professing non-Christianity. Pelagianism was widespread, you know. Donatism, which was an extreme movement, it almost took all North Africa at one time. I don't think I mentioned this when we were talking about Nicaea and the great struggles to affirm the deity of Jesus Christ, but that was touch and go for decades. The council was sound. The majority affirmed that, but there was a great deal of opposition. I did intimate the way the emperors vacillated on the matter, and we all know how Athanasius was in ex exile about seven or eight times, and so on. But nevertheless, the point is that Pelagianism, really antithetical to Christianity, was widespread and actually approved by the pope in one particular uh, instance as well. Five, today, obviously, most of those who profess Christianity are professing a religion which Machen called liberalism in his definitive volume, admired even by liberals, entitled Liberalism and Christianity. You notice that? Liberalism and Christianity. Not liberal Christianity and conservative Christianity, but liberalism and Christianity. Machen's quite right. He shows what goes by the name of liberalism. He wrote this book in the mid-20s, and you know, the mid-90s, far worse, and so on, that what goes by the name of liberal Christianity denies the deity of Christ, denies the supernatural, basically, have anything to do with the virgin birth, Bodily resurrections are out of hand altogether. No miracles ever done by Jesus Christ, and yet they're calling themselves Christians. No, says Machen. These are two different religions. And I mentioned there the fact that even the liberals admire this book. Some of the liberals are embarrassed, you know, to be accepted as Christians when they know that what they're holding is really incompatible with real Christianity. Some of them hold on to them because it's a part of their tenure. They belong to an institution which is traditionally Christian. It's expected. You have situations where seminaries have been for a century hopelessly liberal, but they take the most conservative vows when they take certain, cer certain chairs there because that's been a part of the history. They'll swear that they believe just as the Puritans did. They agree with Cotton Mather and these other people and so on. They only have to share their views in the slightest. That sort of thing happens. Well, it happens in the church as well as in the universities and so on. And this comes to be, numerically, the largest constituency in the Christian church today in these United States, one of the most conservative countries in the world. It's another form of religion. It ought never to be confused with Christianity. And lo and behold, it constitutes the majority of Christians. That book remains a classic. And when I was at Harvard, for example, in the early 40s, which was an absolute bastion of liberalism, they used it. They approved of it. That's a good, solid statement. They, they didn't want to be confused, as it were, with orthodoxy. It's another religion altogether, but that never becomes the general understanding of what various and sundry institutions are teaching. Numbers 7, the solution. 
True Christians must raise an ensign against false Christianity. If the world chooses to go on calling that Christianity, which we label counterfeit, the world will go on perishing, but their blood will be on their own head and on ours. Let me bring this home at this particular point. You can't actually live with that as if it were a valid form of Christianity when you know it's absolute counterfeit. You have got to say, this is not Christianity. You may not have to write a book on the subject, and you may not be able to be as precise and articulate as J. Gresham Machen was, but you've got to recognize that that is another religion, and you've got to be on record against it. I maintain it could never prevail in modern churches if everybody who cherishes the gospel of Jesus Christ would actually put the finger on that and indicate this is another religion altogether counterfeiting as if it were a form of Christianity. And instead of allowing ourselves to debate this subject as if it were a difference between liberal Christianity and conservative Christianity, and thus giving the impression that they're a little bit out of line, maybe to the left, or we're a little bit out of line, maybe to the right, or something like that. We call this what it actually is, a counterfeit form of Christianity. I can't keep repeating too often the fact that that's a de utterly deplorable thing that that would even exist, that it becomes a majority report is unthinkable. There's some, there's some responsibility on the part of the people who are Christian. They're being silent. They're not speaking. They're not raising their voice. They're not saying, this is not the real article. Here again comes the question of honesty. How can you be a real Christian and not bear witness to the truth? Is this not another instance? If you're not for me, you're against me? Nobody wants to be against Christ. But when you're not against the antithesis of his gospel, how can you fail to be against him? Number eight, liberalism denies the deity of Jesus, the divine trinity and inerrant scripture, the fall of man, the wrath of God, and the only salvation through the atoning blood of the cross. Most of our mainline seminaries are training our youth to go into all the world to undermine the gospel. If there's anything ludicrous, it certainly is to maintain an institution for the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ at considerable expense and sacrifice in some cases, which institution you know is dedicated to the destruction of the Christian religion. And you know very well that if your sons and daughters study in that particular institution, you will be very fortunate if they come out with any evangelical faith. But this is the preposterous thing which is it happening, and it's happening under the name of theological liberalism, which should be called theological counterfeit. Number nine. Satan appears as an angel of light when he who is the messenger of eternal death pretends to be the way to eternal life. True Christians must never weary of warning the world of him and trying to win the world to its only savior. I'm always a little uneasy with these slogans and these lifestyles and so on, but that one way that symbol that the kids were taking a few years ago to say to the world there's only one way. It's, that's got to be done, whether you raise your finger or whether you write a book or whether you lift your voice or you withhold your funds or whatever. There's got to be an opposition to this phenomenal attack on Christianity in the name of Christianity, wounding Christ in the house of his friends, not enemies like Islam who are avowed opponents, doing everything in their power to destroy Christianity and attract people away from Christianity, but people who bear the name of Jesus can call themselves Christian people. What I'm saying now, I'm talking as an evangelical to evangelicals. We've got to be to blame for this. You know this couldn't happen if everyone in his own corner bore his witness and raised his voice against this? If it's an indubitable datum that liberalism predominates and predominates in our so-called Christian institutions, we've got to be to blame. I mean, we're the heart of the church. We believe in the church. We're ready to die for Christ. And yet this thing grows up in our own backyard and we can wash our hands of any guilt. Search your hearts, Christian friends. As far as I can see, there is just no way 
if theological liberalism could exist, not to mention become the majority report. Finally, number 10, one of the greatest American liberals, Harry Emerson Fosdick preached of the peril of worshiping Jesus. When I was once trying to win a Muslim in Khartoum, he told me that he had heard Dr. Fosdick say that Christ was only a man. Here I was trying to persuade this Muslim sheikh that Christ was the son of God. And if he didn't believe in him, he would have no savior. And Jesus Christ was the savior of the world. The only way of salvation was he, and he was a smart sheikh. And he said, uh, you know, there was a fellow at our school over here in Khartoum, came from New York, and he made it very clear that Jesus is not God. He told those people they didn't have to believe in Christianity. He gave the impression they could be good Muslims. But one thing was clear. I don't remember his name, the sheikh said to me. I know he's from New York. What was his name? Doctor, doctor something. Let me, wait, let me fetch it around, he said. I think it began with F, all right. Fa, 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 fa. I said, Fosdick? Yes, yeah, it, Fosdick, he said, Fosdick. So here I was trying to win a person to Jesus Christ who was using a Christian minister from New York as a defense for my apologetic witness to him and my evangelistic endeavor to win him. That's up what we're up against when we talk about liberalism, which advocates the peril of worshiping Jesus when what we have to have as a message for the world is the peril, my friends, of not worshiping Jesus.